Collection Radio. So uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's wonderful to see such a strong turnout on this issue. Uh, my name is Michael Karanikolas, and I'm the Senior Legal Officer for the Center for Law and Democracy. That's a Canadian NGO that works to promote foundational rights for democracy. This is my first rights con. It's also uh, my first time leading a fireside chat, as I was told it would be. I'm slightly disappointed there's no actual fireplace here. Um, so if you came expecting that, I apologize, and hopefully you'll still enjoy the conversation. Um, I know that I certainly will because we have uh, an outstanding panel here, and I guess we just should start by having everyone introduce themselves, maybe from the left to the right. Kes? Uh, well, you call my name, I'm here. I'm here so I can uh, open that for you. Yeah. Yes, you guys have to open that for Kes Park, uh, open that for I'm Ellen I from the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, India. 
I'm David Kay. I'm the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression, and I teach at UC Irvine. Hi, uh, I'm Augustina del Campo, and I'm the director of the Center on Studies for Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Argentina. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Parsons. I'm a postdoctoral fellow and managing director of the Telecom Transparency Project at Citizen Lab. Um, so CLD has been over the past year uh, carrying out a research project in partnership with uh, the partner organizations uh, here, the Arabic Network for Human Rights Information, the Center for Internet and Society, the Centro de Estudios en Libertad de Expresión y Acceso a la Información, and OpenNet Korea, as well as uh, Tamir Israel of the University of Ottawa and Christopher Parsons of Citizen Lab. And the purpose of this project has been to try and define good practice for the private sector in promoting and protecting freedom of expression. Just to give you a brief introduction to the topic and why we are engaged here, um, private sector intermediaries now hold unprecedented power over how people access information and express themselves and have become uh, major mediators over online speech. These firms make decisions which can dramatically impact the lives of hundreds of millions of people and set the tone for global conversations. International human rights rules are primarily designed to bind the actions of states rather than private actors. The former are designed are obliged to serve the interests of their people um, and are granted a monopoly on powers such as the use of force and the right to imprison. Powers that must be constrained to protect to prevent abuse. By contrast, corporations operate with more limited power uh, and are expected to pursue their own interests, potentially even if these do not align with the general public interest. And yet, although states are the primary duty bearers in terms of human rights, uh, there are also moves to develop the idea that the private sector has a direct responsibility, whether of a legal or moral nature, to respect human rights. In the field of private online intermediaries, there are currently no accepted standards for what makes good practice from a human rights perspective. The most prominent initiative aimed at improving the conduct of private sector online uh, service providers, the Global Network Initiative, mainly focuses on how companies should push back against state interferences. And while that is a crucially important area, it is just the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of the impact that private sector actors have on online speech. Consequently, uh, as part of our research into this field, we identified six areas uh, that are of critical concern to how private sector conduct uh, impacts freedom of expression. And these are expanding access to the internet, net neutrality, moderating or removing uh, user content, protecting privacy and anonymity, transparency and informed consent, and responding to state attacks on freedom of expression. So based on this map, we developed a core research project, including contributions from our partner organizations, which uh, leads into a set of recommendations for better practice among private online intermediaries, uh, both of which are currently being reviewed by an advisory panel, including global representatives from governments, the private sector, civil society, and academia. The core research project is, uh, we thought, a bit too lengthy to distribute here, um, but we have printed out copies of the first draft of our recommendations, which hopefully have been distributed, uh, and which will uh, hopefully be a starting point for discussions here today. I know that these are a first draft and that we're still sort of working around the terminology, um, whether to describe them as applying to private online intermediaries or online service providers. Um, so hopefully we won't get too hung up on that in the discussions. And I also want to note that these recommendations are exclusively focused on the private sector. So obviously we don't mention uh, issues like intermediary liability, which is cru crucially important, um, but where the recommendations uh, would be generally targeted at governments on that issue rather than the private sector. So that's uh, my brief intro uh, to our work, just to give you a sense of how we're going to organize this conversation. Um, we're going to start uh, with a few sort of um, questions, with a short question and answer session to the different panelists, um, followed by a discussion session among the panelists, followed by a broader discussion, including the audience. Um, so I've been told that there should be questions from the audience popping up periodically behind us uh, through Slido. Um, hopefully you can uh, save those until the latter part of the presentation where we're going to be um, interacting more with the audience. So uh, moving on to our panel discussion, uh, I want to start with um, David Kay, who is not one of our research partners uh, for the project but has agreed to serve on our advisory panel. And I also know that this is a major area of focus um, for your work as Special Rapporteur. 
So I thought I would begin by asking you why you see this issue as being so important to the global discourse on freedom of expression. Great, so thanks. Thanks for having me on the panel. Thanks for organizing this research. Thanks for being here. Just thanks. So um, I, a I would just say a couple of things, and I want to be really brief because I, you know, hopefully, well, I do want, I want to hear from my co-panelists. But one thing is that, um, so a special rapporteur, one of the things, one of the main things that I do and other rapporteurs do is we hear from people around the world about particular violations, right, of their freedom of expression. And increasingly over the last, you know, over the last years, but certainly over the course of my mandate over the last 18 months or so, um, there have been an increasing, there's been an increasing number of uh, violations that we learn of that are both driven by governments, so governments uh, punishing people for what they're doing online, so in this kind of quasi you know, private public space, unclear what it is exactly. But also, um, you know, sort of a new kind of violation that is where individuals claim that a private actor is censoring their content with or without any connection to any particular government regulation. So in part, we're, we're launching into this area because it's clear that it's a, um, a growing area of violation of freedom of expression, or at least a growing area where freedom of expression um, is, is challenged. So that's, that's one thing. The second is exactly what, what you said before. I mean, there is, I don't think there's very clear guidance in this area, whether we're talking about jurisdiction, so cross-border kinds of issues, or we're talking about very specific issues, for instance, um, terms of service, right? Should terms of service and community standards be based upon human rights standards, or should they be based upon something else, civil discourse or something? Now, some actors will say, you know, we're a private space, so we can uh, kind of regulate the, the expression in this area according to what we think is, is appropriate. But should that be really a human rights framework, or should it be something else? So these kinds of issues are coming up all the time, and so what we're doing is we're launching a project. Um, now it's a, we're, we're, I'll be reporting to the Human Rights Council in June, um, mapping you know, what are the different areas of the ICT sector that are relevant, that implicate freedom of expression, and then within that, what are the legal issues and policy issues uh, that, are most, uh, that are most critical of some um, you know, normative standard standard making kind of process. So that's what we're doing, we'll release that. And the thing I would just conclude on is, I think it's really important for us to slice ICT. There are different issues according to the different parts of the sector that we're talking about. So the freedom of expression issues that pertain to telcos are really quite different. You know, they're very highly regulated. They're very different from the issues that are faced by search and social. And so I think we need to be careful about saying there's some general, uh, I mean, there are general principles that can apply to all, but I think to make them really um, effective, we need to focus in on specific principles, specific guidance in particular sectors. So uh, thanks so much for that. Um, moving on to our other panelists. Um, if, maybe if I could start with uh, L and I. I know that CIS has been heavily engaged on the issue of zero rating and net neutrality. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of familiarity in the room with the controversy surrounding free basics. Um, obviously, though, Facebook is not the only uh, zero rating program operating. And uh, as a representative of an Indian organization, which has really been on the sharp end of uh, this issue, um, maybe you can give us a survey of what your research found in the general landscape on this issue for South Asia. Sure. Um, so, so I think I would... Uh, start by saying that zero rating can be seen as a form of price discrimination uh, in that an internet service provider favors an application, service, or platform um, over others for a fee assessed to the application, service, or platform or for a competitive advantage. Um, it can also be seen as a form of differential pricing uh, which would be the practice of offering a service or content either for free or at a lower cost or not counting data use towards a data plan, which other subscribers in the zero-rated ecosystem would otherwise have to pay for. 
um, in in our research, I think we saw a number of different types of arrangements for for zero rating. So it can be subsidized, where essentially the cost of the data is passed on to another player, such as an application or a platform. It can be negotiated, so platforms can negotiate with service providers to offer their service for for free. Uh, it can be mandated. The government may mandate that a certain service or website be offered for free. And it can also be self-initiated. So the service provider themselves offers uh, a service at, at a, uh, for, for free. Um, just to give you, uh, so so we looked at we looked at India, we looked at Bangladesh, and we looked at Singapore, and we didn't find any examples of zero-rated services in Singapore, but there are examples of zero-rated services in India and in Bangladesh. Um, perhaps the most popular being Free Basics, of course, where um, individuals can access Facebook and a pre-selected um, list of websites uh, through the the Free Basics platform. Also in India, Airtel in 2013 had offered something called Google Free Zone, where um, users could access Google services for free as long as the usage did not go over 1 GB per month. And Grameen Phone had partnered with Telenor to launch a Wowbox application. And the application allows Grameen Phone users with an Android phone, phone to access free content that is provided within the application. An application um, also allows users to browse the content on the homepage and buy data packages. And often, the zero-rated services are coupled with incentives to uh, encourage users to buy data um, data packages. Uh, the idea being that at some point they would move out of the the zero-rated um, ecosystem onto the the wider internet. And those are examples of partnerships, um, examples of service providers uh, offering company uh, zero-rated services uh, would be EasyNet. So Grameen Phone uh, offered a service where users were provided free access to Facebook and Wikipedia on the Grameen Phone network, and consumers were also given um, the choice of purchasing small data packs, as well as video tutorials on how to use the internet. And Airtel Zero had also launched a service that never actually came through, where they uh, were service or platforms could register with Airtel and then have their um, services zero rated for a fee. Now, we've also found that different things uh, influence, different factors influence the impact or the potential impact of zero-rated services in a, in a context, including the, the size of the ISP or a platform, uh, the market structure of a context, the service that is zero-rated, uh, whether a company is foreign or local, and the degree of internet penetration in a, in a given context. I think perhaps I'll, I'll just quickly Stop, stop there, sure. or I, I can go into critiques and concerns around zero rating. Well, we're going to talk think, about that in a bit. Yeah, yeah, so I'll just give that as a very broad overview. Of zero but thanks for that overview. In, in South Asia. And uh, I think my next question is for you, Augustina. Um, there's an ongoing debate as to how privacy should be understood and protected in the digital age. And one of the most important aspects of this is the debate around the right to be forgotten. I know that uh, Sele has taken a strong position on this. Do you want to um, give some information of uh, what that position is? Um, certainly. Um, let me start by saying a couple of things. One, um, I Sele did this research, uh, but Paula Vargas was the principal investigator on this, so she is the author of the piece that I'm talking about, so I'm going to try to convey her message uh, as good as I possibly can. Um, having said that, and quoting our uh, founder, Eduardo Bertoni, the right to be forgotten is an insult to Latin American history. Uh, so that, I think, sums up uh, what we at Sele believe about this, um, about this issue. Um, a lot has been said about the theory of uh, the right to be forgotten, how to balance those rights. The, the truth is that, um, and what we found out with this paper, is that Latin America has a long way to go in resolving this particular issue. And um, our main contribution with this particular paper towards this particular research 
was uh, to think of a framework uh, within which we can think the right to be forgotten in Latin America specifically. And to do that, we did an extensive review of the standards that the Inter-American Commission and Court have uh, developed over the years and that apply fully to the debate of the right to be forgotten. Um, so let me quickly or briefly um, go through the specific recommendations that uh, we talked about um, in, in this paper. Um, first, we, we believe that there should be specific legislation on the, or regulation on the right to be forgotten and that the overall regulation and other more broader rights or circumstances should not apply to this particular set of, uh, of, uh, of issues. Um, the other, the second recommendation is that any discussion within the uh, private companies and uh, within state legislators and within anyone who's trying to do or apply the right to be forgotten should be framed within the inter-American system and within its particular principles. Um, any decision on filtering, removal, or blocking of content should be, um, should be, um, should be upon a judicial order. Um, so what this means is there shouldn't be any liability for intermediaries uh, outside of a judicially uh, emitted court order to do so. And the last point is limiting the intermediary liability to non-compliance to a uh, court order or, or non-timely non compliance with a court order. Um, very briefly, as you know, the inter-American system has very particular standards on freedom of expression. They include the right to seek, in part, and receive information. They prohibit prior censorship, and the inter-American commission and court have developed very, um, very deep standards on the protection of public interest and uh, has developed further the concepts of um, and social and individual elements to the right to freedom of expression, um, those should be balanced in this debate over the right to be forgotten. I'll leave it at that sure. for now. Um, so moving on to you, uh, KS. Um, keeping on the subject of the growing role of the private sector in adjudicating freedom of expression issues, I think that in Korea, private intermediaries now form an instrumental part of a highly pervasive content removal system. Do you want to explore that issue a bit? Yes. Uh, uh, I can say this. The Korean government has engaged in what I would call uh, constitutional laundering. Uh, what I mean is uh, the laws are set up so that they don't obligate, uh, the, the, the laws don't obligate the intermediaries to take down contents, but the laws only allow them to take down content, right? Uh, and because it doesn't have a compulsory force, it is not subject to constitutional challenge because uh, whenever they take down, it's the doings of intermediaries, not doings of the state. And uh, so, so the laws are uh, only optional, but the end result, because of the, uh, the state paternalism that surrounds the business environment and also the mandatory registration system for all the, all the intermediaries, uh, the intermediaries uh, end up uh, complying with uh, all these government requests, although they are not mandatory. That's why the role of intermediaries is uh, really important. And I mean, another uh, another benefit for the government uh, in making these laws optional as opposed to mandatory is that because I mean, for the pretext of uh, being optional, they can make the coverage much overbroad, right? Uh, for instance, uh, Korean Communication Standard Commission, which is the internet uh, censorship body, uh, it can send out uh, corrective, uh, what we call corrective request, which are again optional, intermediaries don't have to follow. Because it's optional, the standard is, quote, what is necessary for nurturing communication ethics, unquote. So it's not just unlawful content upon which these takedown requests are made by the uh, censorship body, 
uh, it is also unethical contents, or the contents that the government censors believe are unethical. And yet, look at the compliance rate, close to 100%. There's a, there is a, another law about private takedown request, uh, uh, takedown request uh, issued by private parties. They are also, it's optional, it's not mandatory. Uh, if someone argues, someone, uh, if someone uh, argues that certain content is uh, defamatory or privacy infringing to him or her, the law says in the intermediaries may take down those contents. Again, it's optional, but they comply almost 100%. The same thing with the privacy as well. You talked about content removal, but the same thing on the privacy side, uh, especially the lifting of anonymity, uh, li the lifting of anonymity of an otherwise anonymous communication. Uh, there are also uh, intermediaries are not required, but only allowed to give away uh, the uh, identification uh, information of uh, the parties to an otherwise uh, anonymous communication. I mean, when I say anonymous co communication, I'm talking about you know uh, uh, like yeah, metadata of a certain uh, phone communication uh, or uh, certain content posted anonymously on uh, on a certain URL. Uh, so. Uh, there, again, the compliance rate is uh, 100%. Uh, so uh, the roles of uh, uh, intermediary are uh, really important. I mean, this it, is not just typically Korean. I mean, uh, in American ECPA, um, also intermediaries are allowed to uh, release metadata to a uh, non-government uh, investigative uh, investigative authorities. So uh, uh, intermediaries are not allowed to uh, release uh, metadata to FBI, CIA, uh, or uh, U.S. government agencies, but they are allowed to release uh, metadata to private people or to uh, foreign governments, for instance. But American intermediaries don't comply with those requests uh, you know, as uh, faithfully uh, as uh, Korean intermediaries. Um, so uh, I, I think it's really important to see through the face of the statute. Uh, you should not just, uh, you know, rest appeased that, uh, you know, these laws are only optional. Uh, depending on the business environment, uh, it can have uh, a very uh, compulsive force uh, crossing down on privacy and freedom of speech. Thanks, and I think that that discussion about the interaction between intermediaries and the state and how that can create new dangers to speech uh, leads very well into Chris's research, uh, which noted that companies' uh, systems can actually derive state surveillance capabilities. Do you want to expand on that a bit? So I'll just start by thank everyone for, for being here and thank you for being invited onto the panel. Um, so I'm working with a, a colleague of mine at the University of Ottawa, uh, Tamir Israel. And so what I'm going to present is the, the half of the work that, uh, that I've done, which really focuses on Canada, the US as a case study and looking at how telecommunications companies um, that provide access, so AT&T, Rogers Communications, Bell Canada, some of the activities that they're involved in um, now, why exactly does it matter to folks on intermediaries and transparency, at least in the Canadian and in the American situation? It's because a variety of new laws have been passed that facilitate new kinds of government surveillance. And so in the Canadian context, we have legislation authorizing malware, authorizing new kinds of uh, warrants for metadata. And as a result, um, we need telecommunications companies to explain to us what's going on because there have not been corresponding statutory requirements placed on government to explain how they're using those new powers. So what I want to do is, before getting to here's how um, telecommunications companies can be really helpful, I also want to point to how they can facilitate increased surveillance and often in ways that are not well understood. So many of us are probably well aware of how peering functions. So this is where two ISPs exchange data traffic. 
In, in the Canadian case, uh, research by colleagues of mine at the University of Toronto have shown that most ISPs are peering in the United States as opposed to internal to Canada. That has the effect of changing who can access Canadian telecommunications data and removing the privacy rights that Canadians enjoy because as soon as it flows into the United States, of course, our laws, our privacy laws stop at the border. So this is one way in which uh, the decisions, the business decisions of telecommunications companies, and that's done because it makes it more challenging for small ISPs to peer. So it's for business reasons, not because they want to facilitate uh, surveillance. So this is one way in which business decisions can, can facilitate a foreign state's surveillance. There are also um, business reasons uh, that promote corporate surveillance tools that are not nefarious until they are turned that way. So one of the better examples of this is prior to 9-11, um, AT&T had a business analytics system to detect fraud. So they were able to identify uh, parties who were calling one another, and they used it to you know, figure out, okay, this is a fraudulent call. They also used it to sell different kinds of packages to AT&T subscribers. They could figure out you're probably calling home a lot, it's long distance, and so you're, you're a good person to get a certain package. Verizon did not have this kind of business analytics system. So shortly following 9-11, um, the United States government became very interested in calling patterns. Um, and so one of the earliest things that they did is they actually tapped AT&T on the shoulder. And because AT&T had the system in place, they were able to facilitate the U.S. government's subsequent surveillance of call records. Now, of course, there are other methods that's also been done. But at the outset, uh, that business practice facilit facilitated that kind of surveillance. There's also when you have good business practices for CSR purposes that are turned against customers. So in the case of Canada, Rogers Communications retains a log of every single URL one of their subscribers visits for up to 31 days. They don't do it because they think that you're visiting child pornography or anything of that nature, but rather they record and modify um, web pages to inform you when you're approaching your data cap. So you have 100 uh, gigabits or gigabytes of data that you can move a month, but it means that Rogers has to retain a record of every unencrypted URL that you visited, which means when the government comes and they serve a production order, that kind of information is suddenly available. So this is another way in which a business practice that is not ostensibly nefarious can be used by the government. And then the last thing that I'll just briefly touch on that uh, is, is being done, and this is in the standards organizations, and this is where companies are cognizant of what the government thinks it wants, and particularly as it pertains to encryption, and attempts to get ahead of government so that they don't face legislation. So here, uh, one example is Rogers and Altel Lucent um, at uh, Etsy, which is the European standards uh, body, worked to compromise an end-to-end -end encryption system called Mikey iBake that provides uh, encryption on the voice plane. The rationale for this as I understand it, is that if they could undermine the encryption provided by this mode of voice security, then they would remain compliant with lawful interception legislation and forestall new government legislation. These are some of the things that businesses do. But the other thing they do is they promote transparency reporting. And this, it can't be underscored how important this is and how political it is. So in the Canadian context, several years ago, um, the telecommunications providers got together and they said in a single year there are 1.2 million requests, in a country with a population of about 35 million, 1.2 million requests for subscriber data. And under Canadian legislation, there was a quiet working agreement that this would happen only in child pornography cases. Um, it affected about 700 to 800,000 people. Releasing that information um, immediately changed the political discussion in the Canadian context. Moreover, as telecommunications companies have released transparency reports, what we've seen is governments are becoming more hesitant in what exactly they do, because in addition to the raw numbers, which are very important, it's also including narrative. And so this is where some companies are starting to indicate the kinds of challenges they're dealing with in court or more abstractly, some of the problems or concerns they see on the horizon. And so in this way, um, telecommunications companies aren't just, in some cases, facilitating modes of surveillance, but also providing the, the tools and the raw data that's needed subsequently by 
academics, advocates, and indeed other telecommunications companies to then advocate against some of the practices that they see as overreaches. So I think I'll just leave it there. And then... So uh, thanks so much. And I think we're going to move to a bit more of a freer conversation among the participants first. And I want to start um, by asking a more general question about uh, human rights in the private sector. Um, and maybe starting with uh, David, not to put you on the spot, um, but uh, understanding that states remain, with, given that uh, states remain the primary duty bearers for, primary duty bearers for guaranteeing human rights, including freedom of expression, with that understood, do you think it's fair to say that uh, some responsibilities can attach to the private sector as well? And if so, to what extent? Right. So, so to answer that question, I think it's really hard in the abstract, right? I mean, I do think that it's that that we do need to think about it in terms of specific sectors and specific um, activities of different actors, right? So, like I was saying before, right? So telcos are highly regulated in each jurisdiction where they operate, and so they have a responsibility to comply with local law, which often puts them in, puts them into the position of um, in a very real way, uh, participating in surveillance of their customers, right? So what's their responsibility in that context, right? That, that's a Do they have a responsibility not to engage in that service? Can they resist the, um, uh, the imposition of local law in that context? I mean, I, I think that's an open question, and it's also an open question as to whether actually they're resisting or their exit is a net positive for freedom of expression in those in those environments, and this is not. I mean, just I'm just focusing on telcos here, but this isn't an issue that's just in one jurisdiction or a couple of jurisdictions. This is happening um, all over the place, right? So, so I think answering a question like, are there human rights responsibilities, needs to be focused on a on a particular area. I mean, I would say generally speaking, there are there are principles that you know are drawn from. Um, you know, from Global Network Initiative or from uh, the UN's Business and Human Rights um, principles that, at least on a process sense, I think are important to follow, things that um, encourage transparency, human rights due diligence, and so forth. But I'm not sure we're much beyond that right now in terms of um, actual obligations that right now can be imposed on um, on intermediaries, but it really it really depends on us looking at specific contexts for those for those issues. I mean, I was really interested, for example, to hear about how it's operating in Korea right now, where there's 100% compliance with these takedown requests, and that's um, so they're allowed to do that. But what is what's the responsibility to resist those takedown requests if they're not consistent with human rights standards? I, I don't. I think part of our project needs to be to identify what those responsibilities actually are. So maybe I can sub-clarify and uh, break that question down a little bit, and hopefully some of the others can um, jump in. I think that it could be useful to break that down into two aspects. On the one hand, you could say uh, private online intermediaries have a responsibility not to be complicit in human rights violations, not to be themselves violating the human rights of their users. And that's what you get with the, that, that, that's sort of the harder edge of it, where China or Azerbaijan is asking uh, a particular online service provider for information about one of their users that you, they're going to be using to prosecute uh, a journalist or an opponent. And then beyond that, probably a, a bit more tricky, is the area of whether um, human rights uh, responsibilities to promote and um, um, facilitate human rights fall on the private sector. And here you get it's particularly challenging because although this is um, sort of flies in the face of, of traditional understandings of how human rights work, um, I think that the internet has changed the, the game a little bit in the sense that uh, private online intermediaries are now a primary mechanism by which people exercise human rights, particularly freedom of expression. And so this is a bit of a game changer from, uh, say, newspapers or, or, or broadcasters where previously these um, were mechanisms that the, pre that the privileged few would use to exercise freedom of expression and the masses would use to access information but not necessarily as an expressive medium. And the difference with the internet is you have primary modes, modes of communication, primary expressive activities that are um, under the control of the private sector. So does that 
change the game, but does that lead to new responsibilities to attach? Does anybody want to take a shot at that? Um, a similar question came up in the morning session um, with uh, uh, terms and conditions. Um, I forgot the full name of the session, but uh, it, it, the, the session dealt with uh, how terms and conditions of uh, intermediaries uh, can be uh, uh, upgraded uh, to protect uh, uh, human rights. Um, I think that uh, what I said there uh, is that uh, we should work on the minimum. Uh, not, I mean, uh, David asked whether it should be the human rights should be the construct of uh, this uh, CSR or a uh, greater, uh, you know, civic. Uh, civil discourse, uh, if you uh, try to add more uh, on top of uh, human rights, uh, I think that it can uh, actually harm uh, innovation. It can harm intermediaries, uh, uh, intermediaries uh, incentives to uh, uh, experiment with uh, different problems. I mean, we uh, uh, we fought against the uh, real name law and we got this struck down. The reason that we did that was not because all real name systems are bad, uh, but because the law mandating all platforms to be to go real name uh, is harmful to uh, everybody. Uh, there are some platforms that choose to go real name uh, for certain purposes, and they do fine. Uh, as long as they encrypt all the data, as long as they don't uh, give up identity data so easily. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, we should uh, try to uh, not to think of uh, intermediaries as uh, like you know broadcasters who have some you know fairness, uh, impartiality obligation in presenting the in you know in presenting both sides of uh, debate things like that because uh, uh, I mean the internet is about giving uh, everybody a chance to say things uh, even though they do not fall nicely under this uh, uh, you know umbrella of a public interest right uh, people falling out of the spectrum should be able to. Uh, say completely partial things, uh, as long as uh, they can, you know, as long as uh, uh, they don't defame, they don't, you know, call, they don't present clear uh, present danger of uh, violence, uh, things like that. Um, there, there was a, I, I, I think, a, a, a interesting flashpoint was uh, uh, FBI versus uh, Apple. Uh, which became a non-issue suddenly uh, last week. Uh, but uh, even there, uh, I mean, some people will be thinking, oh, you know, there is a great public interest in fighting terrorism, uh, and that uh, there might be, I mean, one, one, one big issue is whether the government can f compel companies to create any software, not just, you know, not just, uh, not just privacy infringing software, but any software, right? So there, there was a freedom of speech issue there, uh, but some people may be thinking, oh, you know, there has to be some regulation of a software industry, and that some, uh, you know, s some people, uh, s some software maybe uh, should be compelled, in, uh, compelled to be made uh, by by the government for uh, public interest, not just for fighting terrorism, but I don't know, for fighting environment, for I mean, for fighting. Uh, environmental pollution for uh, for other uh, public interest. So uh, I, I think there is a, a lot to be uh, thought out about how much public interest obligations that we want to put on uh, the intermediaries. Human rights obligations, yes, I think they can be placed as the as the uh, as the as the minimum uh, requirements. Uh, uh, for instance, we can ask, we can demand that all intermediaries. Have a provision in terms and conditions uh, that says, uh, you know, we will not discriminate uh, content unreasonably. Uh, we will take down unlawful content. We will take down content that violates uh, published uh, uh, content policy. But we, other, other than that, we're not gonna, you know, uh, uh, discriminate uh, content, right? Uh, 
but outside that, uh, we should think hard about uh, putting uh, public interest obligations. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that, or should, or should we just jump straight to these uh, discussion questions? Sure, please. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say, in, in the context of zero rating, I think it's a really um, interesting question because the dialogue around zero rating is so closely centered around the right to access and bridging the digital divide. And so, you know, it's brought up a whole set of questions around roles and responsibilities of the government or governments to provide to provide access and work towards bridging the digital divide and, and the private sector. And it's not just about the private sector respecting or safeguarding a right, but also now enabling a right, um, which I think there's a, a little bit of a distinction there. And I think um, it's, it's raised questions of regulations. And I think, interesting, the pushback against zero rating services in India also raised questions about right or it, citizens or users being able to choose who, who is providing these rights, um, the government or, or the pr private sector and how. And I think it just also demonstrated the importance of human rights practices being embedded in both a service, its implementation, and um, the launch of, of a product within, within a context. So uh, why don't we, since these questions appear to be piling up, uh, why don't we just uh, jump in to start addressing these? Um, so the first one is, those who report cite evidence that the inclusion of narratives in transparency reports leads to a reduction in government requests. Um, the report itself does not cite that evidence specifically. Um, I don't know if Chris can comment uh, more to whether it impacts government behavior. That being said, um, as someone who works uh, quite a bit on the right to information, um, I can say that transparency is a great force in um, reducing bad government conduct. And this is as true in um, countries like the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. as it is in uh, India and Pakistan and um, um, the Maldives and anywhere in the world. Um, so I'm not sure that transparency would lead to a reduction in government requests, but hopefully if you had strong transparency, it would uh, discourage frivolous requests or discourage uh, fishing expeditions or generate a stronger conversation about whether or not the government is going too far. Um, Chris, do you want to add to that? Yeah, so one of the, the better examples in the Canadian case, at least, is Rogers Communications uh, along with uh, TELUS, so two of our larger mobile uh, providers. Uh, Rogers noted that they were engaged in a protected um, constitutional, or sorry, charter challenge um, with a particular police agency. And this was around um, tower dumps. So Peel Regional Police had gone and they got a production order for 14 Towers of Rogers, and I think it affected something like 40,000, 50,000 subscribers, something like that. So it was just an outrageous overreach as far as Rogers was concerned. And they had been fielding these sorts of requests for quite some time, and they just had enough. Um, and so one of the rationales for having that narrative in their transparency report was to, I mean, no one functionally reads them. I mean, they're, they're, they're documents that are read by a very select population. But part of that population was law enforcement and was government that was not very happy that any transparency report was coming out. Rogers Communications was the first to release one, and they actually were good enough to do it in, when they were presenting at a parliamentary committee without forewarning, as far as I understand, to the government. Um, so this was meant as a, a, a red flag. Like, if you continue doing this, we will continue fighting. Um, and so in that sense, my... Uh, understanding is that it did lead to a reduction in the breadth of tower dump requests until the court case had, had worked its way through and the result of the court case should further reduce um, the uh, uh, the over breadth of some of the tower dump requests so that isn't an indication where you know all of a sudden we have 40% less interceptions or something in Canada but it does indicate that the narrative has a way of the corporation put, just planting a flag in the sand and saying, hold on, you can't, you can't keep doing this, and demonstrating that they're going to flex a little bit of muscle on a particular issue. All right, thanks so much. Um, so uh, the next question that we got in says that uh, the discussion is focused on government pressure on intermediaries. Fair point. Um, 
can you comment on the impact of private requests for removal of content? So we do go into this in our recommendations as well as um, in our uh, report. And I think that at least three, I think three of you, uh, your contributions addressed copyright. So why don't I discuss how we engage on this in the recommendations and then open it up. Um, so we looked at this issue very carefully and we came up with several recommendations for how um, private sector intermediaries should, uh, ad should approach this um, challenge. Um, including recommendations. Uh, it's, it's most of Section 3 in the handout that hopefully you guys are, have all, um, are reading eagerly um, that says, for example, that where necessary, legal policies um, should be accompanied by user-friendly explanatory guides, um, that access, uh, actions to address problematic content should be applied based on clear predetermined policies. Private sector intermediaries should apply these policies consistently uh, and should scrutinize uh, claims carefully before applying measures to remove content. This should include monitoring users who repeatedly file frivolous or abusive claims and to scrutinize claims from these users more carefully. Um, we uh, recommend that private sector intermediaries should notify users promptly when content that they have authored or are responsible for is subject to a restriction. Um, we suggest that where it's possible, users should be given a right to appeal against uh, measures to restrict their content. Um, we suggest that actions to remove or restrict content should be as targeted as possible. Um, and this is uh, in line with the, the idea uh, more broadly in um, freedom of expression that any actions to restrict speech should be as targeted and proportionate, uh, necessary and proportionate as possible. Um, so if you have a large document or an entire movie and there's 20 seconds of problematic uh, movie or problematic uh, sound, Within that, you shouldn't be blocking the entire movie. You should be endeavoring to block those 20 seconds of sound. Um, we also mentioned that uh, private sector intermediaries, uh, uh, where action is taken on content, um, uh, copyright reporting mechanisms should provide information both to complainants and to users about limitations and exceptions to copyright. We'd like to see that when you're filing a claim for copyright, for example, you should have a screen coming up saying, are you aware that exceptions to copyright include this and this and this, that the following material cannot be copyrighted, et cetera? So that's a few of the areas that we've addressed in our uh, recommendations. Maybe I'll um, throw it over to the participants to discuss the removal of content as well, maybe starting with Agustina. Uh, well, some of the we we looked at how the DMCA was being applied in Latin America and how it has been incorporated into different companies' terms of service and um, how it's, the regulation is not necessarily uh, legislatively incorporated in each country, but the terms of services of different uh, corporations have been using the framework of the DMCA to take down uh, content. And um, among the recommendations that we had were um, a clear explanation of what con constitutes a copyright violation and what doesn't constitute a copyright violation. Um, a clear statement regarding the implications of falsely um, accusing a content of being um, a violation to copyright law and the sanctions that you could be subject to for repeatedly reporting or misreporting um, non-compliances with copyrighted um, information. Um, some of the other recommendations that we had were um, regarding the protection of whistleblowers and how this could, um, how this mechanism could be used to protect or disincentive um, the use of the DCMA uh, to to disclose whistleblowers and requiring an, uh, an affidavit that the um, report or request to take content down did not, uh, the, the, the content itself did not constitute a denunciation of a particular crime or um, um, a particular um, felony. There's also, I think, considerable evidence, certainly in the CELE um, submission of uh, political abuse of the DCMA. Um, I know that there was a very long list of um, cases, most of which emanated from Ecuador, uh, abuses by the government there to take down um, political content, but from other countries in the region. Well, those examples were the ones that, that led us to recommend that a clear 
uh, explanation was provided as to what constitutes a copyright violation and how copyright material is different from uh, self-image um, and, and from other instances or, or, or elements. Uh, in Ecuador, this, this particular D DMCA regulation has been used a lot by uh, Ecuador's president to request that content be taken down. And used in the United States. Yeah. So they weren't making the claim subject to Ecuador's courts. They were going to the United States and making the claim there, which adds an entire new dimension to it. The fact that you have uh, a different countries' judicial systems being used to stifle democratic discussion. Exactly. Um, so why don't I um, move over to this side and uh, do either of you want to um, join in on uh, the discussion of copyright? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, when intermediaries uh, or any private actors uh, uh, behave irresponsibly, you know, that's where law comes in, right? Uh, so uh, many copyright takedowns take place uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, through the DMCA notice and takedown procedure. And uh, you know, ma many of the takedowns are done on uh, lawful uh, material as well. So uh, you know, to, uh, to counter that, we have a, a provision uh, that makes uh, not intermediaries, but the takedown requesters liable for submitting bad faith uh, takedown requests. Right? Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, one way of uh, countering uh, uh, too many uh, uh, takedown requests is to uh, set up that type of provision. And you know, some people may think that that provision uh, is not really alive. It's a it's it's a dead law, but it, it is not. Uh, we have a similar law in Korea. Uh, uh, where submitting bad, you, you can be liable for bad, uh, submitting bad faith, bad faith takedown notice. So there was a song, um, there was a popular song that was uh, uh, hum, uh, that was hummed along by a five-year-old, and her father took a video clip and put on his blog. Uh, someone, uh, in, uh, uh, Korean copyright music, was, uh, Korean music copyright association submitted uh, takedown notice on that. It was obviously fair use. Uh, so it was considered bad faith take, take down notice. The father sued uh, the copyright association and actually won damages for submitting uh, bad faith uh, take down notice. Uh, so uh, I mean, th there are ways to uh, counter, uh, you know, the wave of uh, overbroad uh, take down uh, requests. Uh, let me just correct what I said earlier. Uh, I said 100% compliance on. Uh, you know, release of a subscriber uh, or uh, re release of uh, identification data uh, on otherwise anonymous communication. Uh, now it's not 100 percent because uh, uh, when we sue the intermediaries for uh, giving away the data, because uh, uh, now it's intermediaries' responsibility to uh, uh, you know gi giving up the data, uh, and we won up to the uh, higher court. I mean, we won up to the intermediary uh, appellate court. Uh, when we got there, all the platforms, they, all the major platforms, they stopped, uh, they stopped supplying the data altogether. The telcos continue to supply the data. But telcos cover the 90% of uh, uh, 10 million data requests every year. So uh, I said 100%, now it's 90%. Uh, we, w we lost at the Supreme Court, so now the uh, platforms are still free to, uh, uh, now platforms are free to uh, c continue giving away the data, uh, but uh, so far they said they will not resume uh, giving the data over to the uh, um, uh, authorities. So, so there is a kind of a big difference on how intermediate, uh, how intermediates respond to uh, these requests. I don't know whether that is uh, relevant to sure. uh, David's uh, comment earlier. And my understanding is that in Korea, the intermediaries themselves don't want safe harbor provisions. Is that correct? That they prefer to keep it kept out of their hands? Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, the conversation is much more uh, complex than that, but um, 
So uh, I said that you know the takedown, the the optional takedown law uh, said you know intermediaries may take down uh, whenever uh, someone claims that certain content is uh, defamatory. Right? Doesn't have to prove, but uh, but if someone just claims, uh, they may take down. Uh, they have uh, interpreted the law so that hey. You know, we have no power to decide whether it's defamatory or not, so we'll just take it down, right? So in that sense, they would rather have law that does, than, that does not give them any leeway. Uh, the, the benefit for the intermediary is that when we sue the intermediary for taking down the content, taking down unlawful content, uh, the, the court can easily say, hey, they were just discharging their legal duty. Um, so uh, in that sense, the intermediaries uh, prefer uh, because it, it provides them, uh, it provides them uh, with an exemption for taking down lawful data. Uh, some of them uh, prefer uh, just uh, the laws that require them to uh, take down data instead of a safe harbor. Ellen, I did you want to add uh, anything? Um, I, I think just from you know the Indian context when it comes to online copyright infringement, the biggest issue uh, we have is through John Doe orders or Ashok Kumar, Ashok Kumar. Kumar orders, where essentially um, content providers can approach a court and have an order issued for the blocking. It's almost like a preemptive blocking to ensure that copyright infringement won't happen. And um, ISVs have been known to block torrent sites and um, peer sharing sites based on these orders. And there's also often a lot of over compliance that happens. So links, just links of infringing materials not taken down. Instead, whole websites are taken down. So I think um, usually private entities don't approach the, the intermediary directly. They go through courts, but this doesn't help solve the the problem because court orders can of course be pre preemptive, they can be vague, and um, server providers can also over comply and, and do over comply. So the next question is that even if you are against the right to be forgotten philosophically, <clears throat> would you support mandatory disclosure of raw data of such requests to vetted researchers, not currently happening in EU? There's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, and I'm not sure how you would determine vetted researchers. There's a few issues that we um, raise with regards to this in our recommendations um, and in the core research product. One of them is that uh, where information is being released to researchers, it's, pro it's important that it should be anonymized properly. Um, so we cite the example of, I think it was AT&T, that uh, released a huge amount of um, their users' uh, uh, browsing information, browsing histories after it had been anonymized to researchers and researchers were able to de-anonymize it fairly easily based on things like the fact that a person would often be Googling themselves or Googling their address in terms of um, mapping or directions issues and so it, it, it allowed them to unpack that. So that's one issue that we do address connected to that. Um, generally speaking, we support, well, it's, I should say the recommendations, the other organizations have not um, um, uh, endorse these recommendations, so I don't want to um, give that indication. Um, but um, the recommendations mention a need to have very strong transparency and very strong um, reporting. And so we would include uh, getting that down to the granular level as much as possible in order to provide researchers with as much useful material to work with uh, as they can. But that being said, um, it, it's, uh, there are privacy concerns there that would need to be considered. So I don't know if anyone has uh, more precise answer to that? Well, I support, and I think uh, uh, from the morning session I hear that Article 19 also supports mandatory disclosure of uh, uh, right to be forgotten request to uh, everybody, not just vetted researchers. Because uh, only by making that available, people surfing the web will know that their search results have been massaged. Mm -hmm. I also would support some version of, of transparency in reporting, but it's, it's important, maybe the spirit of Eduardo is, is here too, but it's important if we're going to have right to be forgotten, um, I mean, we have it in Europe, 
and it's expanding. In order to know the impact, we have to have transparency. And it, it can't be that it's only available um, in a very narrow way to vetted researchers. I don't know. I don't know what exactly that means. There needs to be real transparency around the implementation of right to be forgotten because if it's true that it is um, restricting access to information, whether it's historical information and right to truth kinds of issues, or whether it's if it's restricting our ability to get a good picture of our societies or whatever it might be, I think we need to know that. Um, and we certainly need to know that in a context where right to be forgotten is, is young, it's new, and um, it's not necessarily um, sort of a, uh, a forever kind of doctrine. And if people can show that it actually is having a negative impact on access to information, I think people need to know that. Uh, and just on the issue of transparency, um, it's uh, interesting to note that on the right to information issue, the right to information issue is in, in some ways on the cutting edge of applying human rights responsibilities to the private sector. And the fact that there are many right to information laws around the world which already mandate, which already apply to private companies. So um, South Africa's, uh, the, the most common way in which this is done is the right to information law will say that it applies to a private sector entity to the uh, extent that that entity either performs a public that is already applied legally binding requirements on private sector enterprises. Um, the next question is that uh, decisions regarding content with, uh, withholding are increasingly made in the first instance by companies. How can or should appeal mechanisms work across borders? Now, this is a very tricky one. I think we already discussed it a little bit by the fact that you have the Ecuadorian government, or I'm not sure if it was demonstrably the government or someone acting on their behalf, um, but basically um, working in the United States to take down uh, inf content that's critical of them. You know, there's been a lot of attention paid recent years to the problem with libel tourism and the need to crack down on that. And I think potentially we're seeing it pop up again uh, in the sense that um, a lot of countries are uh, taking the approach that essentially they can regulate the entire internet. Uh, and if every company does that, you get sort of a race to the bottom where it's very easy for um, people to shop for a jurisdiction uh, that suits their needs. In fact, even easier than with libel tourism. Because with libel tourism, you actually need to have a lawyer in London. Uh, for this, it's, it's, it's even easier than that. All you need is a <laughs> Mark Stevens adjusts his tie. Um, <laughs> um, for this, it's even easier than that. So I don't know if any of my colleagues want to comment on that, on that question. Well, one, uh, one principle that should be abided by in setting up the uh, appeal mechanism is uh, the requester and uh, the take down requester and the author of the content should be given fair chance. There has to be symmetry. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you know, if you look at how DMC notice and take uh, notice and takedown works, it is transparent to what copyright law uh, is applicable, because. Uh, uh, if somebody asks, it goes down. If the author uh, submits a restoration request, it's, res it's restored. Uh, it doesn't matter you know, which copyright law applies. So it, it, can, it can be applicable across the borders. And then, I mean, in the end, the intermediary doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't have a duty to take down if the requester resubmits the, uh, uh, you know, re, uh, resubmits the uh, takedown uh, request. Uh, so I, I think there, there are ways to, uh, uh, I, I think there are many ways that uh, you can come up with a, a symmetric um, you know, appeal process. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just, I just want to add that um, this, is, this is precisely why uh, companies should not be doing these things. <laughs> uh, these kinds of problems are precisely the reason why courts should be addressing these kinds of issues and delimitating. Really? Controversial. I don't see any harm to any uh, significant harm to freedom of expression or right to know to pass a law uh, combating revenge porn. It seems to be a very clear issue to me, and 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 as somebody who works primarily to promote freedom of expression and the right to information, I don't see this as a particular threat to merely pass a requirement that uh, companies or any website that hosts content which contains uh, naked photos of people 
to require uh, explicit consent from that person to host the content. It's a tiny infringement in freedom of expression, and it's, it's very simple to do. So I don't see that as being the sharp edge of it. However, that question about the tension between freedom of expression, the right to information, and the right to privacy does cut to the heart of a lot of what we're discussing here, both with um, the right to be forgotten and a lot of these other issues, particularly because the same tools that have facilitated this incredible expansion in the right to freedom of expression, where people can, uh, a 13-year-old in his basement can speak to an audience in the millions around the world, this incredible megaphone that it gives to everybody to broadcast globally and this uh, amazing, all these benefits to freedom of expression, those same technologies have shrunk people's private space and have had uh, a detrimental impact. Well, I won't say detrimental, but have certainly worked to erode um, people's private space and have um, limited the level of privacy that people can expect. And that is a core tension in understanding human rights online as far as I'm concerned. So that I certainly want to open up to anybody who wants to comment because I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of good ideas. I don't know if that's true, really. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the internet has created mechanisms for, for governments to surveil and to interfere with privacy. There's no question about that. But, um, do, you know, is there this, so the way I would propose that we think about these kinds of issues, and Gabrielle keeps hearing me say this, right, is it's not just about, it's not a question of balancing these different rights, right? It's a question of in this particular context, like so if we're talking about a particular publication, right, and the question is what is the basis to restrict the publication? And if your argument is it's privacy, well, it can't just be, well, I have this right to privacy and this is, it's more important than this right to expression. It has to be how do you justify the restriction on expression? And you, re you can justify restrictions on expression according to, as Toby probably has made you, you probably dream about this, <laughs> it's the three-part test, right? So, you know, is it provided by law? And is it necessary and proportionate to achieve a particular legitimate objective? In this context, it would be protection of the rights and reputations of others, the right being right to privacy. Now, if it's necessary and if it's a proportionate restriction then fine, it can be, then that's, to my mind, how you resolve any potential conflict between expression and restriction. But, um, but to frame it in a broad sense, and there is clearly a tension in that situation, but, but I think it's resolvable as a matter of human rights law. It's not, it's not a, um, uh, it's not an unknown, it's not an area where there isn't law. No, but I do think that the internet's changed the game a little bit. So in the sense that um, you previously have uh, uh, tensions between freedom of expression and the right to privacy. Certainly, I, I absolutely agree that it's resolvable within um, human rights law and that there's a balancing that needs to take place. No, I don't uh, think there's a balancing. Oh, there's, there's a, well. <laughs> That's my main, my main, my entry point is it's not a balancing. It's a question of applying the restrictions. If we're talking about ICCPR, the restrictions under Article 19.3. To me, to my mind, that's not a balance. Now, there are broader, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are broader questions about a digital age and our ability to maintain private lives, right? That's, that's for sure. But, but when we're talking about specific restrictions on specific publication of something, whether it, I agree with you, revenge porn is an easy question, but if it's something else uh, where there are harder cases, law provides us with the answer. It doesn't mean, I don't mean to be arguing that the digital age is, you know, um, is great for privacy, but I mean that, that we have to think about specific questions in the context of what the law actually provides for restriction. Sure, well, I, I agree with that. <laughs> so we're done. <laughs> now. Um, so do we have time for one more, or do we need to wrap it? Or, well, one more. Uh, so the next one is, uh, how should terms of service be addressed when they represent a more narrow interpretation of freedom of expression when compared to international human rights law? Um, in the earlier terms of service discussion, um, we talked about how uh, a couple of the speakers talked about how they were 
completely masochistic for forcing themselves to go through these incredibly detailed terms of service um, and trying to puzzle out what they mean. Certainly, um, in the terms of service that I read as, as preparing this, um, the report, uh, I found that they're, and, and this is as somebody who has a law degree and works in this field, um, I found that it's incredibly difficult to puzzle out what specifically they actually mean in a practical sense. Uh, and they seemed um, self-contradictory, uh, as well as impossibly vague, and basically just to license the intermediaries to do almost anything. Um, so I certainly think that that's problematic, and I think that there's sort of a mutually reinforcing tension there where nobody reads these terms of service. And the fact that nobody reads these terms of service essentially gives companies license to put whatever they want in there. And similarly, the fact that these terms of service are written in such an impossibly vague way uh, that it's almost impossible to get a practical understanding of what specifically is done based on them discourages people from engaging with them uh, uh, in, in a sort of a mutually reinforcing thing. So I do think that um, there, there is a strong need to clarify and to make these terms of service more um, accessible and also to encourage people to read them. Um, but I'd be keen to hear if any of, uh, any of the other panelists have an opinion there. Um, I think, so A, readability is wonderful and there's different tactics in how it works. But I actually think that one of the more interesting things about terms of service in combination with privacy policies right now is that courts are starting to get their teeth into them and it's not going the way that um, companies tend to expect. So uh, there's a case in Canada where as a result of um, analyzing uh, a company's privacy policy, terms of service, it was found that the company's disclosure of information was actually contra to what a reasonable person reading those documents, meaning the Supreme Court, what they would interpret it to mean. And so I think to some extent, it's companies have to be careful about what's in their terms of service now, lest they be hung by them. Um, many, I mean, I am a masochist like others on that panel and have spent way too much time looking at terms of service for social networking companies, uh, fitness trackers, and a bunch of others. And there's things in them that if you actually like push them um, and, and, and you get the companies to react practically, they do not react the way that the terms of service state that they will react. Um, and so they have internal corporate policies that are strongly divergent from their legally stated policies, which may differ from their technology policies, which we've also analyzed in some cases at the lab. So terms of service I see is actually a, a particularly useful way of interrogating companies and promoting better practice. Because if you just look at terms of service alone, you, you get to where you are and sort of sad that you spent the time doing it. But if you do it with a few other pieces of research simultaneously, terms of service can be turned into a really nice way of, of encouraging companies to at least reconsider some of their practices because you can point to what they have legally promised, especially if they're an American company, is not compliant with what they are actually doing. Um, and especially if it comes down to what's in their privacy policy, you also get into a situation of, you know, you can go to the American, some American institutions and say, this is a contractual agreement, they're breaking the contractual agreement, what are we gonna do? So um, I think on the one hand, you know, we can think about narrowing them or something like that, but I actually see them as a, a useful tool if, if you wanna find a pointy end of a stick. Can I say two quick things on that? One, I, th I agree, they're, um, they can be used not only by individuals, but also by governments. And that's, and so the court issue is interesting, but it's also governments, right, that are, are seeking enforcement of terms of service, even where those where government itself might not have the power to take it down because it would be inconsistent with freedom of expression, you know, domestic laws protecting expression. So that's, that's an interesting thing there. The other is um, actually some companies have made an effort to make them readable, right? So, I mean, Twitter last month, I think, posted pretty readable page that, you know, was talking about, um, you know, the kind of content that they want to see in a generic sense, right, on their platform. And um, I think that, I mean, that's a good thing that they're moving, but that doesn't answer the, the kind of this, the, the specific question uh, about, you know, which, which are we comfortable with, right? Which, uh, which standards should apply? The standards in, in the terms of service or community standards or standards in, under human rights law? I think that's a real, that's a hard question right now, or at least it's an open question. Actually, I don't think it's that hard, but um, it's, I mean, I think human rights law should apply but it's an open question, uh, for sure. 
So uh, with that, I'm being told that we need to wrap it. Uh, my how time flies. Um, so thanks very much uh, to our panelists, and thanks very much, everybody, for attending. And please look forward to the... And please stay tuned for the release of the full report. James Clapper. Well, actually, uh, when was this? It was this year, right? This was this year, this yeah. This year. 
um, making a statement about how uh, IoT is going to um, be beneficial for surveillance. Um, so this was in direct testimony to submitted to the Senate. Uh, in the future, intelligence services might use the Internet of Things for identification, surveillance, monitoring, location tracking, and targeting for recruitment, or to gain access to networks or user credentials. So I think that um, what we're looking at is here uh, kind of an expanding, um, uh, an expanding, I guess, um, uh, a wealth of devices that uh, haven't been available in the past. You know, the fight. Uh, this year has been about the Apple um, iPhone, uh, and obviously computers are another target. And now we have uh, we have to widen this um, to the Internet of Things and all the other available targets that um, are going to be beneficial to surveillance. So I want to actually just sort of start by asking the panelists um, not to define IoT, but tell us maybe in your minds like what are the most surprising IoT things that we might not think of as IoT. Um, that could be used for surveillance. Broaden our minds here of our understanding that it's more than refrigerators, more than toasters, even maybe more than cars. What are the things that are the most surprising IoT that we might not think about and the ways that they might be surveilled? So, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to draw a line between what is IoT and what is not IoT. I think for me, my definition um, is in many ways focused on the in some ways, the, the form factor and the lower capabilities. So the, the smarts of the computer in question are smaller, uh, usually don't have a dedicated display. And I think that um, we can think uh, of smartphones as sort of the prototypes of IoT. Um, and in many ways, we can expect that all of the capabilities that we see in our smartphones today to migrate smaller and smaller, lose their displays, and get embedded into all sorts of devices. Um, I think we see this trend exemplified by the wearable trend. So we see, you know, smart watches. Um, we see uh, sensors being put into shoes. Um, eventually, I'm sure we're going to see, you know, Google Glass was canceled, but I'm sure that we're going to see other wearable form factors um, that are either going to serve uh, as essentially phones themselves or that are going to connect to the phones, the more capable phones that we carry in our pockets. Um, so for me, I think that in many ways, the IoT, the surprising direction of it, is not things that are embedded in devices that are static, but that we carry around with us all the time. And so you're suggesting that uh, what we might currently have as an IoT device, that single feature, are going to be broadened uh, to have more capability. They're going to have more capability, and I think they're also going to, one of the really interesting challenges or problems that we might see down the road is that these devices are going to network with one another. Um, so if there are devices that are being developed by big tech companies that own several different IoT sort of markets, um, they might be networked together. You might see collaboration in their privacy policies and their data exchange, um, or you might even see uh, collaborations across companies. So you have, you know, one company that focuses on athletics and, you know, have